What's up, Chuckers? This is Nook, and I've got Kick with me today, and uh, we've done a lot of interview shows lately, so we thought we'd change it up a little bit, kind of go back to our roots. I don't know if it's roots or what, but uh, yeah, today we're going to do a historical episode and talk a little bit about uh, slingers in ancient Rome. Now, Kick, are we talking about the, I mean, Rome covered about 2000 years of history. So are we talking about uh, a specific era, era in Roman history or are we just kind of covering that broad stroke? Well, yeah, that's the thing. When people talk about the Roman period, um, there's a few different ways of measuring it. There's like there's the Roman kingdoms originally uh, that started with Rome's founding in 753 BC. And then I mean, if you follow it all the way up to the end of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine era, then it ends in 1453 AD. So it's a really, really long period that you could talk about Rome generally. Um, Most people think of the Roman Empire, which was 27 BC to 476 AD, which is still quite a long time. (laughs) Like, um, So I think with this episode, it's going to have to be broad strokes, really, because... There's a lot of different periods, there's a lot of different battles and sources, and there are fewer for the sling, because as we've talked about multiple times now, the sling is often forgotten in history, um, but there's still quite a lot of information. We could be here a while if we were, if we went through everything, so... Fair enough. I've gone through and sort of picked uh, some, some interesting points, some of them are ones that we've already talked about a little bit when we're talking about conflict, and then... Um, some others are sort of a bit a bit less well known, perhaps. So it could be quite interesting to talk about. So yeah, I think the one that we've talked about before, and I think is good for just maybe a, an idea of what people thought of the sling um, generally in ancient times, is uh, from the Roman writer Vegetius, and we've talked about this before uh, in his book De Re Militari. He basically suggested that all recruits of the Roman legions should be taught how to throw stones, uh, both with a hand and with the sling. He also mentions the Balearic Islanders, which we'll come back to in a bit, because they're a very important <laughs> part of the Roman, Roman history of slinging. But um, it does seem that they really understood that the sling was a weapon. It was a useful weapon against enemies, even if they were wearing armour, and that the injuries from a sling could be very could be very devastating with the sling not actually being any problem to carry around so it was understood by people in in that time that the sling was a very useful weapon to know about and to for their soldiers to use so uh again we're not going to be able to talk about every single instance of uh, the sling being used throughout roman history but i thought this was quite an interesting one um there were some expeditions against the galatians uh or the gauls in anatolia that livy talked about in 189 bc so roman republic era he describes here this uh, expedition by manulius Vul- vulso and it it's quite propagandistic, uh, which isn't that surprising from uh, a Roman source. They, whenever they were talking about their enemies, you know, they they had to sort of play up the fact that they were the civilized Rome, whereas they were going up against these barbarians. Thank goodness we don't do that today. No, that would be crazy if if that carried on today. <laughs> Propaganda would be terrible to experience. Um. So uh, he says that uh, on all sides they were being hit by the arrows and leaden bullets and javelins which they were powerless to ward off. This is talking about uh, the Galatians being hit by these arrows and interestingly leaden bullets. So there's already a mention of sling bullets. We know that the Greeks had before it it was carried on into the Roman period. So they were being used for a very long time. Um, But they were blinded by rage, rage and fear and... They did not see what they were to do, and they found themselves engaged in the kind of fighting for which they were least fitted. 
In close fighting, where they can receive and, re and inflict wounds in turn, their fury stimulates their courage. So when they are being wounded by missiles flung from a distance by an unseen foe and there is no one against whom they can make a blind rush, they dash recklessly against their own comrades like wild beasts that have been speared. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little propagandistic there. <laughs> Um, talking about these wild Galatians that, uh, when they don't, when they don't have an enemy directly in front of me, front of them, they'll attack their comrades if they don't know where they're being attacked from. Those crazy Galatians. Yeah. <laughs> Just like them. That, would, <laughs> that is, but I think it is interesting that it's talking about them being flung from a distance and how, and the kind of, again, it's, it's very propagandistic, but the kind of effect that can have on an enemy, that if you're being attacked and you can't see where you're being attacked from and you don't have a clear enemy to attack, that's quite a psychological effect and I've talk we've talked about that a lot, that the sling is a really good psychological weapon for that. But he also goes on to talk about the sort of wounds that they would get, because the Gauls would often fight naked, and so their wounds would be quite visible. And so they said that consequently more blood flowed from them, the open gashes appeared more horrible, and the whiteness of their bodies showed up the stain of the dark blood. Open wounds, however, do not trouble them much. Sometimes there is a surface bruise rather than a deep wound. They cut their skin and even think that in this way they win greater glory in battle. But when the head of an arrow has gone in or a leaden bullet buried itself and tortures them, with what looks like a slight wound and defies all their efforts to get rid of it, they fling themselves on the ground in shame and fury at so small an injury, threatening to prove fatal. <laughs> Again, just just a little bit of propaganda there that, uh, that these uh, crazy Galatians will cut themselves to make themselves look more impressive in battle. But um, the really interesting thing there is the idea that the both arrows and lead bullets will have buried themselves into into someone and you wouldn't be able to necessarily notice the injury that they would be like that small of a bullet that they would hit them and not be like you know a missing arm or anything i'm i'm a little interested in this idea that they might die of shame as opposed to having a chunk of lead uh disrupting vital organs yeah i, th I think they different ideas of the causes of maybe uh, shame was a medical term at the time i don't know I guess it sounds better to die of shame, maybe, than of... of uh, internal bleeding. Internal bleeding, yeah, of a tiny little bullet. But um, it does seem like, yeah, that they understood the the effects that these leaden bullets would, would have, and that it wasn't the same as, you know, being hit with something much bigger or cut with a sword or something. It was a very different type of wound. And there, there is some talk of the uh, sp specific tool made for removing lead glandes I, I was actually trying to find more information about that and it seems that there might not have been necessarily a specific tool for removing lead bullets from people but it is talked about as something that needed to be done that you'd need to take the bullet out of uh, a person and it was probably that they had you know basically pliers that they would be able to pull bullets out of people so yeah it's again we're kind of Talking about some of the horrors of war here, like that, that these were not nice things to be going up against. The sling has been known for a very long time to be a very dangerous, very effective weapon. Well, so, so since we're talking broad strokes here, it sounds like we can kind of start to confine this a little bit, though. It sounds like the entire Roman era that we're discussing, the preferred ammo was, uh, was lead bullets, not rocks. Is that fair to say? Well, it seems that there's... It's very hard to sort of say necessarily because it wasn't... It, it's not quite as... Um, the the armies of the, Ro of the Roman period changed a lot. In the Republican era, it was, it was a lot less organized. It was a lot more sort of people bring their own equipment with them. If they were richer, they could afford better equipment, better armor, stuff like that. Um, slingers, it's not talked about much. It's shown that they did have, you know, lead bullets, but it wasn't quite as, as, as organized a sort of system as in the later Roman Empire. So it's a little hard to say exactly, but it, it seems that the Balearic Slingers, where they're specifically mentioned, it seems that they did use mostly rocks. Interesting, okay. Yeah, but we'll come back to the Balearic Slingers. There's a lot of information to talk about them, but I thought... 
we, we can talk more generally about some of the slingers, and this isn't necessarily specific groups of slingers. Okay. And they're not usually sort of defined as to where they've come from at, the, at this earlier period. Sure, that's fair. I mean, I guess it's it seems kind of silly to think that they wouldn't use stones if they uh, had a stone available and a sling, and it's war, so why not throw stones if you have them, unless you just have an unlimited supply of, of lead bullets? That's the thing, it, it's such a, such a versatile weapon that you wouldn't have to necessarily use lead anyway. And um, I think particularly in earlier periods they probably did provide some lead bullets, but... I think for the most part they would have been using stones if they could because it's just so much easier to get hold of them. Well, I don't I don't know because the density of lead is so much obviously depending on the stone, the density of lead is so much uh, greater than than a stone that uh you're going to have better range and I would think a more devastating effect with the lead bullet than you would with the stone and so it would be a preferred for warfare purposes it would be a, a preferred choice. That's true, but then there's always the thing with war that it usually comes down to economics and supply lines and things like that. So I imagine for longer campaigns, it would have been a lot harder to maybe supply large quantities. So I don't know, it might have been it, this thing. It's not it's not really specified very much. Um, it's more just like there they mention, oh, yes, they were using lead bullets, but we don't know if they were using just lead bullets or lead bullets and some were using stones it, was it unusual that they had that many lead? But like, it's very hard to say. With a lot of it, there there isn't much specific information. That's fair. That's fair. So, I mean, in terms of mention, it sounds like the uh, the thing that made the biggest impression historically was the lead. Then, because because there's not a lot of talk about them hurling stones, particularly in warfare. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And it it seems that they there was also this idea of throwing stones using uh, like by hand as well in a few different conflicts as well that's that's talked about especially if you're up on a higher area of land and you can throw stones down and you don't even need that much force really if it's already falling to really hurt someone with a falling stone so there's also that that i think it could be that where stones are mentioned it's not it's not always clear whether they were being thrown by hand or by sling either it's it's like the shakespeare quotes suffer the slings and arrows like in that case it's specifically slings but in a lot of other cases it just says stones, and we don't know how those stones got into the air, as it were. There's uh, sometimes a frustrating lack of specificity when uh, trying to go back a few thousand years and understand how people did something specific like this. Yeah, which is, a, like, talking of, like, a sort of specific thing, one thing that's very interesting uh, that I thought should be mentioned is the Kestros or Sestafendron or Cestus or there's a few different names for it, um, which is the dart sling, basically a, a a way of throwing a dart using a sling. And there's been a lot of sort of talk about it as to how it, exactly this system worked because it's very unclear in the description. But um, basically there's only really one mention of it being used and it was used against the Romans in 168 uh, BC in a uh, battle in the Third Macedonian War against King Perseus and and it was the Macedonians that used it and effectively it was a dart thrown from a sling. Now there's a few different ways you could maybe throw a dart from a sling and it's just not clear which is the actual one. I think Acroballistics on uh, YouTube has some really great videos on the Kestrus. You can just search Kestrus and you'll find them. And he has probably the best interpretation of how it was done, I think, which is effectively that it's just a sling held slightly further up the release cord. You can see his video to see exactly how that works. But yeah, specifically a split a split pouch sling. Yeah, just a split a split pouch sling with the release cord held further up. Um because there's it's a there's quite a specific description of the dart, but how the dart is used with the sling is very unclear. So what's interesting is that the plumbata, which came a little later, which was basically a hand-thrown dart, is much more sort of understood how it was used and its dimensions and everything. But there's only this one mention of the kestra, so it seems it wasn't used very much. And I do wonder if it was kind of the specific specificity uh, now it's your turn to mispronounce that word. Ah, i do wonder if it was the 
the fact that it was such specialized ammo um <laughs> that uh kind of made it so that it wasn't used as extensively uh because you know as we're saying if you can find a rock you can throw that if you're using a specific dart then that might not be so easy to manufacture and produce yeah i i think that in the case of the kestros uh by whatever name you want to use it it kind of strikes me as maybe a bit of a gimmick weapon in that uh, the range of a Kestros is not going to be nearly as far as a stone or a uh, a lead bullet. I mean, the sling still gives you some mechanical advantage in hurling a dart as opposed to hurling it by hand, but a arrow would also hurl something roughly equivalent, probably more efficiently and farther and more accurately. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. I think the kind of... it it's such a specifically niche sort of weapon that it it just doesn't have the it, it's it's already covered by other other weapons so i can see why it wasn't used much uh, if at all really after this one battle um that it's known about yeah it just just didn't seem to catch on yeah it just outperformed yeah it sounds to me like it made an impression in that they wrote about it, but uh, it, it may not have actually been a practical weapon in terms of... Uh, if it was practical, then you'd think that other people would have adopted it and it would have caught on and been used a lot more often. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it, it's kind of... Because it's exceptional, it kind of shows that it's an exception. <laughs> that uh, it wasn't something used very often, if at all, after that one battle, so... Now, the, the modern slinging community has taken quite a bit of interest in it. I've seen uh, not only acroballistics, but uh, David Morningstar is another one who has experimented with throwing darts from a sling and several other people. I have as well, yeah. Well, and in fact, technically, the uh, the Guinness world record for the longest sling cast or whatever the their term was for the, sling th- the longest thing thrown from a sling was actually using a dart. Yeah, it was basically a Kestros, <laughs> modern Kestros, so yeah. But uh, yeah, so again, we're covering like vast periods of history here. So we're moving on from 168 BC all the way up to 54 BC, um, which I thought this this is kind of just an, a little aside, basically. But um, one of Julius Caesar's officers, uh, Lucius Cotta, he was uh, hit by a Gallic slinger uh, in the face And it's kind of thought that maybe Caesar uh, recruited the Balearic Slingers for his conquests in Gaul because of the Gallic Slingers that they had. It's known that the Britons particularly were fond of slinging. And um, yeah, it seems that they were able to use them quite successfully. And uh, he wasn't killed by the hit to the face, although I can imagine it was not a fun time. But uh, Lucius Cotter was eventually defeated along with the other Romans in that area during their battles with Gauls. So um it it's not just the Romans using the slings against others as as with the previous uh, Macedonians and the um the Galatians like Rome was it was it, the sling was just a common weapon really for this period of history and it makes a lot of sense it, they're easy to make they're maybe harder to use but they would have been used by shepherds so it's it's a really common weapon at this period. It's popping up all over the place, really. But never in quite enough detail. Not as much detail as I, as I would like, at least. That, that's always going to be true. Now, now for clarity's sake, you know, you mentioned the term slings and arrows. Uh, so one thing we're pretty sure of is that as a weapon, no one ever actually threw the sling at their enemy. Probably not. Although there was, uh, there was an interesting sort of point that i didn't get a chance to go do more research into but there was um sling bullets or like basically lead shot that were attached to strings that you would then throw the string and the shot at the same time um i don't know how wide widespread they were but that's another sort of <laughs> another sort of idea another variation of the sling as it were where you technically were throwing the sling as well yeah, there's there's so many minor variations where a sling becomes some sort of a I don't know rudimentary bola or uh, yeah, and then you start throwing darts and it starts to functionally behave more like a like a bow and arrow, even though it's mechanically very different, etc. Yeah, I mean there there's not clear dividing lines for all of these things. Uh, you know, we we would want it from a 
intellectual perspective to be nice and clean cut and obvious exactly how things are used. And I think the world's just not that easy to describe. It's messier than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, all these different battles and battle accounts, they all have to be understood to be very much a part of their of the time that they were written. And sometimes they're written 10, 20, 100 years after the battles themselves as well. So there's also all those sorts of um, inaccuracies and sort of propaganda and all these different things that can affect how these things are reported as well. So everything kind of needs to be understood that it's not it's not something that can be easily classified. The whole point of history is the study of sources and going from them. You have to understand where those sources are coming from. Yeah, of course. And uh, I know we said it before, but I'll, I'll say it again now that I am not a historian in case anyone was wondering. Oh, neither am I. Not, not anywhere close. <laughs> Please do try this at home, but uh, we are definitely not professionals. This is, uh, and again, this is just such broad strokes history that it's, it, it'd be impossible to go into this in, you know, full professional detail. So another sort of mention of the sling is from Cassius Dio's Roman history. And uh, he was writing about uh, in 38 BC, there was numerous battles against the Parthians and who are famous for the Parthian shot, where you would fire an arrow backwards whilst riding a horse. But um, this is kind of interesting for how... Uh, things could be used against even very heavily armoured uh, enemies, where um, they basically drove away these cataphracts. Uh, Cassius Dio says that thereupon they defended themselves courageously, for most of them were cataphracts, but they were thrown into disorder by the unexpectedness and by one another. They were overcome by the heavy inf- infantry and the slingers most of all, for the greatest difficulty reaching them came from a distance by the powerful throws. So that really shows that, you know, you can cause disruption and chaos in lines even if they're heavily armed cavalry units cataphracts that uh the the distance you can get with a sling and the kind of damage that you'll be dealing would be you know very chaotic for a battle and can really help sow disorder in the uh, enemy lines i i know we've mentioned this before but the uh the momentum transfer on a sling is uh pretty amazing in that armor just doesn't stop that the other day, I was watching a video uh, from a guy who does uh, uh, meteor hammer uh, demonstrations on Instagram, and he had a, a bag filled with coffee grounds, and he was he just wanted to try it against a, a volunteer who was wearing you know a big padded suit, and the guy was attacking him, and he hit him in the head with this bag of coffee, and despite the fact that he you know had something relatively soft. And the guy was wearing over an inch of padding on his head. It kind of knocked him flat. Just the momentum transfer just went right through the the quote unquote armor. It wasn't to stop penetration; it was to stop you know impact. And uh, it kind of knocked the wind out of his sails. And it was a pretty good demonstration of the kind of thing that happens when you get hit with a a lead bullet or a rock, even if you're wearing armor. Yeah, it's it's just the amount of force that gets transferred, and you know you you don't have to go through armor. It's also mentioned in a later battle in 36 BC against the Parthians. Uh, Mark Antony, of the connection to Cleopatra, he was on a campaign there, and he um, it was said that he put them to flight, the Parthians, for his slingers were many, and all of them threw further than the archers, and they maltreated the cataphracts severely, and yet he did not destroy a significant number, for the barbarians rode fast. So, in that case, they didn't kill that many, but it's still said that they were mil- <laughs> maltreated severely, and uh, despite the fact that, you know, they didn't actually kill necessarily many, they still made them move uh the barbarians rode fast but that indicates that they were riding fast away from where they wanted to be necessarily perhaps a not entirely committed enemy but effective nonetheless yeah you can, and, and that's kind of what the way i see slingers being used and what keeps coming up in in accounts of battles is that in the roman period and other periods is that they're good for confusion uh sowing disorder and moving you have you force your enemy into moving to positions they don't want to be in or that aren't necessarily the best for them. So 
it was very well understood how the sling could be used. So what's interesting is that, uh, you know, we talk about the propaganda of history a little bit. Slingers are kind of the most anonymous, most generic entities on the battlefield, right? Like there's, there's not, to my knowledge, and maybe you can answer this kick, uh, there are no slinging heroes like who are, who are known or famous for their ability to sling. Are, are there any personalities that were tied to slinging other than obviously David, who's, who was not Roman? Uh, yeah, there's, there's basically no, none. There's one source in the Viking sagas I've heard that, um, has someone that is known for their slinging prowess. But again, that's kind of like a, I think in the Viking period, not many people were using slings really in a warfare sort of setting. So it's kind of, again, the exception kind of proves that they, <laughs> that it's an exception. Um, it, it is really like a weapon that, that it wasn't really something that heroes used necessarily. It was, you know, shepherds and then the Balearic Islanders, which they, they became the most famous in the Roman world for, slings and to the point that a lot of the time they it's hard to say whether the slingers being talked about were actually from the Balearic Islands or just generally slingers and they were just called that in some ways uh because they were just known as slingers uh a lot of the time there wasn't as much of a definition as to where they came from if the you know the best ones were from the Balearic Islands but yeah it's hard to say exactly where these slingers came from right yeah, it's just kind of interesting to me how uh, there's no particular personality associated with the sling. It's kind of this this crowd of faceless, nameless people who are sometimes attributed to winning battles. Uh, I mean, you've given several examples already where they credit the slingers for turning the tide or for causing confusion or basically being effective in battle. And yet the person who gets credit for that I guess would be the general, and maybe that's again a, a propaganda thing where you know there there really isn't a a lot of glory in being a slinger other than being associated with a group that does good things. Well, it could be said that right up to the present day, uh, it's the generals that get the glory, not the everyday soldiers. But it does seem that the slingers were particularly sort of forgotten about half the time. Uh, there's been a few times where I've heard. I found some small quote somewhere talking about the importance of slingers in some battle. And then I've gone to try and find more information about that battle. And there's been no mention of slingers at all. So it's very uh, difficult to know exactly the effect that slingers had. But it seems that when they were used and were put into the right situations, they were very effective. Um, and it was understood that they were effective, but they weren't celebrated for it. Yeah, you could probably say the same thing about modern warfare in that you don't hear about a lot of uh, you know Medal of Honor recipients who were sitting next to a piece of artillery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, I guess it's by definition, it's a support role that isn't necessarily in the thick of things in the same way as somebody who is on the front lines with a sword. So I, I to a degree, I guess that's fair that the Slingers would be kind of this faceless group. But it, it's kind of interesting to me, n nonetheless, that there's not a specific personality or someone who was the face of slinging. The, the closest you get is a group of people being the Balearic Slingers from Spain. Yeah, I mean, even the ba Balearic Slingers, like, they weren't originally sort of Romans. Um, they were originally the people from the uh, Iberian Peninsula that moved to the Balearic Islands and... Um, and they were living there for thousands of years, but they first sort of came into contact with the Romans through the Carthaginians who had taken over the islands and um, they then fought against the the Romans. And Strabo describes them as, as that they would go into battle ungirt with only a small buckler and a javelin burnt at the end, and in some cases tipped with a small iron point, but their effective weapons were their slings, of which each man carried three wound around his head. So they were going into battle basically naked with maybe just a pointy stick <laughs> and a sling and maybe with a small shield, but not not anything very high tech. And it, it, Strava also said that they sometimes only had a goat skin wrapped around their arm to use as a shield. So they these were not sort of 
in in a lot of ways they they sound a lot like the barbarians that the romans were fighting uh later and in and in other battles that they kind of i wouldn't be surprised if they were, if they were kind of seen as quite barbaric uh at first before their usefulness as slingers and mercenaries was understood because they had a very different culture uh, at that point and yeah they they were quite different to the roman culture in the same sort of period and and what i'm hearing here is that they would have been considered i don't know some sort of a underdog as well yes it's that same thing again that we always talk about that they would have been they would have been underdogs but they they were really recognized for their skill and uh strabo is the one that also talks again about um their training and uh, said that their training in the use of slings used to be such from childhood up that they would not so much as give bread to their children unless they first hit it with the sling. So that's quite a, which, which I try to carry that practice on today before I eat a sandwich. I, I also hit it with a sling. Yeah, same. I, I pasta, anything like that. I first have to hit it with the sling, but you know, that would actually be pretty spectacular. I might have to try slinging at pasta just to get the slow-mos out of it. That would be, yeah, that would be interesting. Slow much. <laughs> But um, all right, moving on. <laughs> but that's that's kind of the thing. Like uh, it, it seems that there was this v- very much this idea that it was very much baked into the Balearic Island culture that they that slinging was very important to them, and that uh, they became so well known for it. And I mean, the Balearic Islands is named the Balearic Islands after Balear. They were known for throwing. Later, when the Roman Empire eventually took over the Balearic Islands after uh, Carthage had been defeated. It was uh, Metellus uh, who went and took over the Balearic Islands. And it's kind of interesting. They said that it was, oh, the the reason we're taking over the Balearic Islands is because of the horrible piracy problem that we have from the Balearic Islands. They're using the Balearic Islands as a stopping off point and preying on ships in the Mediterranean. But um, again, that might just be a little bit of propaganda because... The Balearic Islands were very strategic, and the Romans really wanted to take over Hispania and conquer those previous Carthaginian colonies. So it's kind of a, it might have just been a sort of convenient excuse to take the islands. But uh, once they had taken them, they really made use of the slingers. So uh, Diodorus is as mentioned as well as as we mentioned before they would use multiple slings and uh they said that they would use slings of three different lengths for stones of different sizes although i don't know maybe it could have also been for different distances i would say i think that makes a lot of sense having longer slings for longer distance i don't know i found that that's that makes it a lot easier uh having a longer sling to go a bit further yeah i think interpretation of why they would carry three slings is kind of interesting because uh Today, most most people who are into slinging tend to argue that you should stick with one sling and get really good with one sling. And and here we see the opposite, where they're they're switching up the length of the sling. And to me, it, it, that strikes me as a little bit odd, just because uh, I know personally when I change up my sling and go from a long sling to a short sling or vice versa, I stop hitting what I'm aiming at. Yeah, yeah, I've I found that. Very recently, actually, I've, uh, I've got a video waiting to <laughs> the, where uh, for the competition I switched between different slings, and it does really affect like how effective you can be. Like I, my accuracy goes all over the place as soon as I switch slings. So I do wonder how how off how much they were actually using them as for dif- distances, or if they maybe just had them as backups. I don't know. Um, it's it's again, it's very hard to say. There's very little actually from the Balearic Islanders themselves talking about it. I think there's basically nothing. There's just second-hand accounts. So it's not a proper catch this episode unless I nerd out on the physics a little bit. I mean, we've already got... I think we can check the blood and guts checkbox for this this time. Yeah, I think we got that one, so... Because it, it's been nothing but blood and guts, and we started off with uh, with talking about tissue damage and so on. So um, one thing to mention about the different lengths and different sizes, I think there is some merit to that because... Uh, as you're swinging a sling around, you think of this thing moving, it's a basically a mass on the end of a string that's swinging in a circle. So if you have a shorter sling with a heavier stone, then the natural frequency of that, it's going to spin around at about the same rate as a longer sling with a lighter stone. And specifically, when you look at the Balearic style, and of course, 
broad strokes here. We're, we're talking about modern day Balearic style and trying to attribute that to people thousands of years ago and saying this is exactly how they would sleep yeah. as well, which we don't know. We don't know. But the thing that's interesting about that traditional style uh, is that it actually does make that easier. I've noticed compared to other slinging styles, changing up your sling, changing up your ammo, you can be a little bit more consistent. At least I can be more consistent slinging Balearic sidearm style while changing up as opposed to doing something like a Byzantine throwing style, which is where you swing it over your head once and then and then cast the stone. Uh, the Balearic style where you're spinning it kind of behind your back and then uh, swing sidearm to throw forward seems a little bit more forgiving, maybe is the right term, uh, for changing that up than other singing styles. I think I would agree with that as well. Like, And again, like you said, it's it's hard to know what exactly the style they were doing there. The I think the Balearic style can only really be attributed to a couple of hundred years at the most, I think, as it is now. But I, I have a hard time believing that they weren't using all different types of style like I've seen for myself at the competitions that they don't really teach a specific way of slinging either. Like there's a few rules for some of the competitions as to how many times you can spin it and stuff, but it's, it's very variable from person to person. So I, I, I think really back in history as well, they, they wouldn't have had a specific style that everyone stuck to even within, you know, one culture. I'm sure that it varied a lot. So yeah, it it may, it might be that, that that was the reason that they kind of used those different styles and had maybe they had different styles that they used for different slings. It's impossible to know now, but um, yeah, it's sort of interesting to talk about. Well, and and it's all kind of tied together, right? I mean, if you're if you're changing the length of your sling, you're changing the size and weight of your ammo, and possibly changing up the way in which you throw it. There's there's all you know those are all interrelated to one another. So I guess we kind of have to take history at its word in that they had three different lengths of slings for the purpose of throwing different sizes of ammo. That's It's plausible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't know exactly what that means or you know, how that plays out in terms of their ability to conduct warfare with a sling. It's also interesting, like, with the Balearic competitions nowadays and just generally slingers around the world, wherever, <laughs> wherever they are, everyone seems to have quite different ideas of what sort of regular sized ammo is for them like i know for some people that 300 grams is like oh yeah that's just the normal amount that i use um for myself it's like i usually say 150 to 170 grams but usually it, it can go up about to 200 or something grams something like that for a rock and then with the ancient lead sling bullets that found that often they're, they're sometimes sometimes they're incredibly light like 17 grams or something the only sort of information i could find talking about balearic slingers and the actual weights that they would throw is from diodorus of sicily who was writing in the first century um and he gave an account of the missiles used at the battle of economos so this isn't actually roman uh, this is uh, 311 BC, and it was between the Greeks and, and uh, Carthage. So this was before the Romans adopted the uh, Balearic Islands, or invaded, I should say, rather than adopted, but adopted them as mercenaries. Um, but he said that, uh, but when Hamilcar saw that his men were being overpowered, he brought up the slingers who came from the Balearic Islands and numbered at least 1,000. By hurling a shower of stones, they wounded men and even killed not a few who they were attacking, and shattered the defensive armour of most of them. For the men were accustomed to sling stones weighing a mina, which was 500 grams to 1.25 pounds, um, and contributed a great deal to victory in battle. So, for 500 grams for me, that's that's pretty heavy, I would say, for a sling stone. Like... Yeah, I think that's on the high side of, uh, it's about as heavy as most people are comfortable throwing, and, and it would probably be a fairly short distance. Yeah, I can't imagine that they're throwing, you know, like 400 meters or something crazy, <laughs> like, like the sort of the highest sort of confirmed distances for slings. I, I highly doubt that, but, um, I mean, you almost, they almost didn't need to mention that it shattered the defensive armor of most of them because, 500 grams being thrown any sort of speed from sort of any distance really is going to really hurt if it hits so again it's that the power of the sling 
it can turn the tides of battle um you know it's like that's gonna really do a lot of damage a thousand men throwing 500 gram stones that's that's gonna be devastating i think i'm with you in that i i have also been surprised by how lightweight some of the lead bullets are uh in ancient slinging both greek and roman uh, yeah you're right some are 17 grams which i'm a little suspicious of in that you know something from 2000 years ago might have lost a little bit of weight just in yeah. sitting for several thousand years uh but even so i mean if we're talking order of magnitude whether it's you know 15 grams or 30 grams uh even if it lost half its weight that's still 30 grams is really light for slinging yeah it feels like i think with having very light and very heavy ammo you can hurt yourself quite easily slinging either of them because you can kind of get a lot more sort of like i guess it's like uh what's the term sort of um recoil effectively yeah i'm I'm not a not a huge fan of that term the slingers use that term and it it doesn't mean the same thing as recoil like with a firearm yeah it's it's a different thing i i i I think that term causes more confusion than clarity personally but uh we haven't really developed a very sophisticated language for the biomechanics of slinging uh in modern day slinging in that some of the terms that people use yeah they they mean different things to different people yeah they're kind of taken from other sports or other aspects (laughs) of of sort of throwing projectiles and stuff um but yeah you can you can get that kind of that very hard impact on your own joints through sort of throwing very heavy or very light ammo both of them i think can be quite dangerous in a way if you're not careful yeah i i think the challenge with really light ammo is that it's uh you really have to be in tune with the sling and practice a lot to to have a good feel for where the sling is relative to your hand and your arm and your body. And when the ammo weighs as much or even less than the sling itself, the signals are much more subtle. And so it would be easy to uh, hyperextend your elbow, for example, or, or just move in a way that where the momentum of your, your hand and your arm is going to you know, carry carry your arm in, into places in ways that you really don't want it to go. And yeah, cause an injury, pull a muscle, pull a tendon, that sort of thing. And then same thing on the high end, if you're swinging a 500 gram chunk of rock or lead or whatever around your head, now the momentum of that can, can actually physically pull your arm in directions where you don't want it to go if you relax the muscles the wrong way or at the wrong time. Yeah. So both extremes have potential for injury, a self-injury, in addition to the the normal warfare, blood and guts that everybody knows about. That's, that's the thing. I like reading all these accounts and uh, sort of hearing about the the expertise of these ancient slingers. It's like it it's so sad that so little information has actually made made it to the modern day. It would just be fascinating to actually get a chance to talk to one of these ancient Balearic slingers that and sort of hear about how they go about throwing those sorts of weights and in those sorts of conditions like because they they really were very widely used julius caesar took them to gaul as well and used them there like mentioned before against the gallic slingers they they really had a long period of being used in battle balearic slingers and just generally slingers so it's a very very large period of history that includes the roman period but goes far before it and far after it um that they were used so there's a lot of information uh that we do have but there's so much more that has been lost and it's it's quite sad really that so much is interesting information has been lost or not gathered in the first place i think the best we can do today is to just kind of assume that people are people and go out and and try to rediscover these things for ourselves and honestly i think that's one of the reasons a lot of uh, modern day slingers really enjoy slinging is that there is this kind of sense of connection that you're doing something almost in the same way that somebody 2000 years ago would have done it now we don't know exactly how each person 2000 years ago did it but you can pick up a sling today and pick up a rock or whatever you want to throw and there is that kind of sense of connection with history where you're you're doing something that would have been done in at least a similar way if not exactly the same recently i I took part in this um, ancient biathlon uh, where I was actually 
portraying a uh, Iron Age Roman uh, Gaul. And the idea of it is that you ski around this island on uh, traditional wooden skis and then use a bow and arrow to shoot an elk. But because I am I am their resident slinger, I was allowed to use a sling uh, with tennis balls, so not all that um, uh, accurate. But um, I managed to hit the wooden elk in one hit, in one throw, I mean. So, um, so accurate enough, obviously. Yeah, accurate enough, yeah. So I was... It, it was a really interesting experience to, to sort of wearing those wearing the clothes that would have been worn so so many thousands of years ago and taking part in something that would have been somewhat every day really you know skiing somewhere and trying to hunt something <laughs> i mean it was a wooden elk so i wouldn't have made quite as good uh eating as a as a real elk and um you know we all managed to like retreat back to the to the warmth of uh modern modern technology fairly fairly quickly afterwards but uh it it is it is really interesting seeing that it has so much connection to history. I think in some ways more than archery because archery has in in a lot of ways the methods and the materials have deviated quite a lot from what was originally used. And you can get into the traditional archery and you know self bows and things like that that are more historically accurate. But with slings, there's still very much more of a connection to history. I feel it's a bit closer in some ways, despite the fact that there's so little information. Yeah, now, to be fair, I mean, there are modern materials that are popular in singing, like paracord, which did not exist in ancient times. True. (laughs) uh, A a polymer string, you know, like a nylon string like paracord, still is basically the same thing. Although, I I do think that you can have a more efficient, uh, you know, lighter, a lighter, thinner sling that is just as strong or stronger and perhaps last longer than something that's made out of grass. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think in some ways, though, the the act of slinging is still... It's so much older than archery, that we know, at least, it seems to be. Um, and it's been used by so many varied cultures. I, I feel... I don't know, I feel somehow slinging feels a bit closer to history <laughs> still, even with modern materials. Well, we'll go with that. Take that, archers. <laughs> So I don't I don't know in terms of the order uh, of how we're going to publish these, but uh, you know certainly we we do uh, have a few things to say in comparing slings and and bows to one another. Uh, if they haven't already published, then they're coming up soon. Yeah, it's 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 often brought up in in slinger circles more than it is in archery because the sling is just not as well known. <laughs> but um... we well, yeah, I I think I think it's one of those things where. You know, slingers feel like they're in competition with archers, and they have to they have to be superior to archers, and and then the archers' response to that is slinger who? Yeah, yeah, it, it's like that. It's like the me the Thanos meme of uh, I don't even know who you are type thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's it definitely seems that uh, it's the slingers that have the chip on their shoulder, <laughs> which definitely trying trying to pick a fight. Yeah, which I think, to be honest, looking back at some of our episodes and yeah, maybe the ones that haven't come up yet is is maybe kind of obvious. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably true, but you know that's okay because uh, you know it's it is what it is. But yeah, definitely, I think uh, the slinging community today is is such a small community that people don't even don't think about it. it's not on their minds as opposed to something like slingshots or archery it's just a much larger group of people yeah and that has both advantages and disadvantages right uh, you know, one of the things that i really enjoy about the slinging community is because it's so small having that in common with someone else is almost enough to just establish a almost immediate friendship there are people who sling if if somebody slings it doesn't matter if they're from you know, Moscow or Guam or Spain or Texas or Finland for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> Although those Finnish, Finnish slingers are a little sketchy, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, there is kind of this instant connection where uh, you have that in common. And because you don't have that in common with so many people, it, it establishes a stronger, you know, bond or connection with somebody else. When you, when you finally do find someone else who knows how to sling. Well, yeah, just just finding anyone that even recognises a sling can sometimes be sort of an achievement in itself. So someone that is actively as passionate about slinging as we are is is quite a is quite quite a find. And you, and I think there is sort of a certain 
parts of personality that slinging sort of points to that really, really sort of uh, means that you usually have quite a lot in common, <laughs> generally. Right. That's that's true. Yeah. Like like to do things the hard way. Yeah. And uh, and an interest in history uh, usually, which you know, usually an interest in history. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, and you know, this this thing we could. We've kind of strayed almost from the the main topic of the episode of the Roman history, but that's kind of the thing. It there's there's not all that much in terms of actual sources necessarily. I think we've gone through almost all of the main sources now, really, that we have for slinging, particularly because they just weren't mentioned. But um, I think that's kind of what's what's special about it is that when it is mentioned, it's really interesting, <laughs> at least for those of us that are into slinging. Like uh, right, yeah. The dimensions are so rare that uh, we kind of like finding another slinger, you know, somewhere else in the world. You get really excited because we were noticed. Yeah, which is another thing. Like, if there's anything that we haven't mentioned here, uh, then let us know about it. And this might not be the only episode we do on on Rome. Who knows? I mean, if we find some more information, that we'd love to bring it to more people's attention. And if anyone has anything that we've missed out that you think is really cool <laughs> basically uh send it over and we'll we'll try and add it into future episodes yep um so you know we talked i think probably more about the the size shape design uh slash choice of your ammo with the sling we haven't talked much about the design of the sling itself that's probably because there's virtually no information whatsoever about it but uh, is, is there anything to say there yeah, there's. It's very difficult to find any information, either in particularly uh, actual finds, because you know almost all slings were made out of things like leather or uh, fibrous material that just wouldn't have lasted. And I think more in. I think something that's kind of overlooked with that is that also they probably would have been used for other things once they broke. Because if you've got a, you know, a nice leather sling and it breaks you're not just going to throw that whole piece of leather away. It's like, you know, a long piece of leather. You can use that to sew something or tie something up or as part of a bag or, you know, there's lots of different things you can use those sorts of things for. So um, there's just almost no finds, um, particularly of the Roman period. I don't know of any slings that have been found um, that are actually Roman. There have been others from other periods of history usually in somewhat unusual circumstances as part of burials or something like that. But with the Balearic Islanders, there is this one piece, which is also from Strabo, that, that's part of the same text that we mentioned before, where he says that the three slings that they would carry were made of black tufted rush, which is species of plant, um, or of hair or of sinews, uh, the sling with the long straps for the shots at short range and the medium sling for medium shots. And for their training for the use of the sling, yeah, and then it goes on to talk about the not giving children bread until they'd hit it, hit it. So it seems that, you know, it was these natural materials, hair and sinew, as well as leather and uh, plant materials, like braided plant materials. Well, even, even today, I think uh, people who get into slinging take it on as some somewhat of a challenge to see what you can make a sling out of in terms of uh, cordage material well yeah like this it's just it's such a simple thing to make that if you can make something into cordage you can make a sling from it so uh like the sling that i used for this um this competition this skiing and uh, elk hunt the sling i used for that is my nettle sling that's made out of stinging nettle and there's absolutely no proof at all there's no find of a sling made out of stinging nettle however there is evidence for cordage being made from nettle and even like shirts and used in weaving stinging nettle fibers so i just i cannot imagine that someone would have seen the cord that you can make from a stinging nettle and wouldn't make a sling out of it because it was the first thing I thought of when I when I found that you could make cordage from uh, from stingy nettle. So, well, you would. Well, yeah, that's true. That is that. Maybe that just says more about me than about slinging, but or slingers. But it, I think it is just if you can think, if you can imagine that someone in ancient history could have made cordage out of it, almost certainly someone at some point made it into a sling. I I find it 
difficult to argue against that kind of thinking. Just it it just makes sense. That's what humans do: is that we find uses for for various materials and make stuff out of them. We don't usually stick to one thing and another. We're very imaginative with our thinking and try and come up with different solutions to problems. And if if the problem you have is I need a sling, you're going to try and find something that will fit the bill. And there's a lot of things that do. So that is definitely true. So I I think one thing that uh, you know may may be may or may not be interesting about the Bel Air sling, slingers as opposed to you know generic slinger is that they are traditionally associated with these uh, grass slings, basically right fibrous plant material slings that uh, tend to be fairly thick and they're a split pouch and obviously different lengths. But you can find fibrous, grassy type materials almost anywhere in the world. So they could make a sling fairly quickly wherever they are, make a sling and pick up a rock and they're ready for battle. So there's a, there's a lot of flexibility and you just basically, the, the person is the asset. You don't have to have all the fancy equipment. You just basically show up and you're ready to go. Yeah, and like Vegetius says, they they're of no encumbrance. Uh, you can carry as many slings as you like. Really, <laughs> it's it's it doesn't really take up much room at all. You can wind it around your head. Take that, archers! Yeah, exactly. You can't carry more than one bow usually, very easily at least. Um, whereas with a sling, you can strap them around your arm, around your wrist, around your head, around your waist as a belt. So, you know, I can carry five, six, seven more slings probably very easily no problem at all so yeah it's it's such a versatile weapon well even even fowler uh talked about how a slingshot which is very small and fits in your pocket can be an encumbrance of sorts when when you're hiking yeah yeah like he he liked the idea of shoving a piece of string in your pocket and having a a projectile launcher because that's uh, less of a burden even than something simple like a like a slingshot fork yeah it's it just takes up no room and the fact that you can use it for other things as well like as you know, straps for a bag or you know you can you can have multiple on you just in case very easily so it makes a lot of sense to carry them around as weapons yeah so so yeah it's unfortunate that from a historical perspective uh they didn't take the time to tell us exactly how these things happen you know what the slings are made of how they're made how they're used what style they used uh how they chose their rocks how they made their lead bullets etc um there's a lot there's obviously a lot more that we don't know than we do know in terms of the historical information on on slings and specifically in the roman era uh since that's what this episode's about but um again i think part of the fun of this is that you can go out and make a sling and pick up a rock um, I'm not sure, depending on where you live, uh, if you're going to try to throw lead, then be responsible and don't leave it in the environment. But, you know, you can pick up something and launch it and, and kind of have that connection to ancient history. Get out there and go slinging. Yeah, everyone get out there. <laughs> right right now. Yeah, go now. Uh, you can keep listening. I mean, they're, they're, modern technology allows things like headphones, so you don't have to stop listening. Don't, in fact, just don't stop listening. <laughs> You can continue, but but get up. Whatever you're doing right now, get up. Unless you're driving, uh, in which case, apply the brakes first and then get out of the car and go slinging. <laughs> Maybe pull over to a safe place first. <laughs> but the, that's that's another thing is if you do find the historical side of slinging very interesting, then joining something like a historical reenactment group, which I've done recently, is is a really good way of finding people that might be interested in slinging. Um that's that's what I found is that you know, it's it's the sling turns up so many times in history that it almost doesn't matter which which period you end up choosing to get interested in. Probably slings will turn up there. So uh, the Roman period they were very important. So Roman reenactment groups are very uh, a good place to go. And who knows you might might find yourself teaching people how to sling or you know getting some people together. There's a there seems to be a uh, similarity to not just in the historical reenactment but in the reinvention. I mean, you, you know, you've got the historical reenactment groups, but then also, you know, there's things like LARPing where people are actually inventing their own little worlds 
And there's a lot of room within that for slinging as well. You know, I won't, we won't get into arguments as to whether elves or orcs are better slingers. <laughs> uh, not on this episode, at least. But, uh, but I, I have noticed that in addition to the historical reenactment, slings have occasionally been popular among people doing, you know, LARPing in a more fantastical way. Yeah. Yeah. It's this, it's a very, uh, dynamic hobby in a way in a lot of ways because you know it covers so many different things you can do it from the sports side historical side fantasy side yeah everyone should be slinging absolutely so go right now we'll wait (laughs) well maybe we should just end the episode here so that everyone can go out and sling okay fair enough with it without a guilty conscience that they've had to stop listening so okay yeah no we we don't want to create any sort of moral dilemma in our (laughs) audience oh so as a service to to you guys we will we will go ahead and cue the outro. Thanks for listening. You can find us online at catchthispodcast.com, on the sling.org forum, on YouTube, and at catch underscore this underscore podcast on Instagram. Music by Wintergarten. Catch you next time.